as I've said, we're not going to go through a review. Go back and listen to the the videos and the audios that we've already done as I pick up in Titus chapter 2. I believe this is the sixth meeting. I could be wrong about that. Titus 2, but I like to do this more, but tomorrow night, Lord willing. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That the age man be sober, that means serious, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. I hate that word. The age women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. Not given to much wine. You know, wine is one of the things for Christmas. Teacher of good things. Now imagine a, a woman teaching about Santa Claus and, and how to make Christmas ornaments. Oh. That they may teach young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. I mean, w would you love your child if you told them about a big fat lie? I don't think so. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, serious, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Everything that's not, I mean, this is everything that is not found in this Christmas study. Sound speech. Ho, ho, ho. That cannot be condemned. You can condemn the practices that we're reading and studying about. That he that is of the contrary part, that he of the contrary part may be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed as a Bible believing, born again Christian to be part of Christmas. You ought to hang your head low when somebody mentions it. Having no evil thing to say of you. How about Jesus Christ? Will he have evil to say of you? Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them with well in th all things, not answering again, not purloining, and that means stealing from the master and from the boss, but showing all good fidelity that they may adore the doctrine of God, not paganism, our Savior, in all things, including a day of the year. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And that's what you say, you know, hark the hairy angels sing and all that. Teaching us that having ungodliness, paganism is ungodliness. And worldly lust. I got to get, 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 get. Black Friday, Black Sunday. Oh, exchange the gift. Kissing on the mistletoe. Mama cut Santa Claus. And we should live soberly, seriously, righteously, and godly in this present world. Christmas is not. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious period of Santa Claus and his nine reindeer. They don't say that? You don't have the Kris Kringle version of the Bible? That there's no angels, there's little elves? You don't have that version? Well, shame on you. I got the King James Bible. Let's see what it says, my friend. It says, looking for that blessed hope. What's your children looking forward to? And the glorious period of our great God. What's your wife looking for? And our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I'm looking for. That's my life verse. Titus 2.13. Who gave himself for us. Santa doesn't give nothing for you. Which Santa is it? I've seen eight of them. That's his elves. How do they grow so quick? Those are little little guys, and I see them all over the, the stores. Who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Does Santa redeem you from iniquity? 
But you teach your children, oh, look for Santa. Santa knows the good. Santa knows the bad. You better watch out. You better not tell that this guy takes God's glory. Redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a particular people. You know people think I'm weird because I'm doing this Christmas thing? You know, they think I'm stupid. They think I'm insane. Well, thank you. You proved the Bible right. It should be the other people, the unsaved people that should be fighting me. Not you, the born-again Christian. Zealous of good works. What does Christmas have to do for good works? These things speak and exhort. And rebuke thoroughly with all authority. Let no man despise thee. There you go. Glory to God in the highest. Letter D. Avoid the rationalizations that, number one, Christmas pro provides a festive time to share the gospel. Yeah. You know what? I can find gold in a sewer plant, but I ain't going to go swimming. One cannot take something something condemned in God's word and use it to spread the gospel. God condemns Christmas, but you're going to turn it and use it to spread the gospel. Neither will God bless it to spread his word. God can't do unholiness. And Christmas is unholy unacceptable worship and the mixing in of unholy pagan forms is surely not the normal means through which God blesses the fruitful I mean can you just see God taking Mary in the book of Acts Mary go put a bikini on and go down to the beach and preach Jesus to him Paul, get yourself a marijuana stick and smoke it with, with, with those, those guys over there and talk about Jesus. But you're going, you laugh, you, you're funny, but you're going to use Christmas the same way. Next, you'll have Christian beer. You've got Christian music that has rock and rap. Throwing up for Jesus, I guess. All right, where were we? Satan works to blend together his system with God's system. Be because when unacceptable worship or paganism is blended with true worship, God's truth, true worship is destroyed. CCM is destroyed music. In the name of God, of course. You can't have the both. In fact, any time one mixes pagan ideas and practices with pure religion of Christ, it is condemned in Scripture as a heinous, heinous sin of idolatry. It's idolatry. I told you last night that you bow down to, to get the presents, and you, you know, you give the credit to who? Santa. Well, the tree is green, which means life, and the red little lights mean the blood of Jesus, and the gold is Jesus, the deity, and yeah, 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 yeah. And you haven't read Jeremiah 10. I know in a church where we were studying the book of Jeremiah, when the church that has the tree, and they went right over Jeremiah 10 like it wasn't even in there. You know it's wrong. But you want to cover up your sins with a fig leaf, Adam and Mrs. Eve. Nothing new under the sun, the preacher said. All right. God has always detested taking those things dedicated to idols and using them to worship them. Have you not read that God says, I'm a jealous God? I will visit the iniquity upon the families of the third or fourth generation. Exodus 20. As a matter of fact, this special time of the year 
is probably more a hindrance to the representatives of the gospel message than any help. Think about those people that go to Christmas and Easter and, and, and I was going to say Halloween, and, and Christmas. You know what their reactions are? Hi, God, I'm here. Aren't you so happy that you get me two times a year? See you Easter. That's pride. Much of the matter of fact, when you get people like that, the, the pastor will spend more time with those people there in the church because we're going to try to get them. They, they ain't interested in serving. All right. Much of the celebration observed by our contemporary society deludes people from assuming that God is pleased. And when in reality, wake up and smell the coffee, he is offended by false religion and alien philosophies. Well, I don't think we should have illegal, uh, illegal aliens in America. Do you think you should have aliens in the church? Why don't you ask them for their green card? Green means life. Oh, they don't have a green card. They have a Christmas card or a Valentine's card. I forgot. He is offended by the false religion and alien philosophy, the ecumenical spirit and a counterfeit love under the guise of peace and goodwill among men. Church and mothership, picking up the aliens, please come home. Go to the red planet and Jupiter. Jupiter? Oh yeah, Jupiter, the big red planet. And uh, the big red planet with the red spot, something like that. What was that image that fell down from Diana? More than likely dulls one sensitivity to his desperate need to repent of sins and be reconciled to a holy God. What's it have to do with anything? It's just an excuse to sin. Number two, Christmas is merely the honoring of Christ's birth. Holy, holy, full of baloney, just as I am. Someone says, I know Christmas is pagan origin, but I still think it's wrong for a church to have a special time for honoring Christ's birth. But since, when did the Protestants believe that Christians had the right to add to the Bible? You acknowledge Christmas is pagan, but you think it's, it, it, it's not wrong for the church to have a celebration. Are we to follow the Bible in our faith and practice? Or to think of fallible men? If we have the right to add special holiday. He says holy day, but I'm not going to call it a holy day. To the Christian economy. Economy. Then we can add 10,000 other things, can't we? Then we will be no better than the false cults and the Roman Catholics who follow the heathen traditions. Now I'm telling you, now that I'm this far under the Bible belt, your Southern Baptist music is sin. I don't care your grandma, your grandpa, your dad, and all that, and your church likes it. It is sin. S-I-N. Devils in the ear. Besides, celebrating Christ's birth is a form of worship. But since Christmas is a lie, those who celebrate it are not worshiping in the spirit of truth. John 4.24. Oh, that's the sword of the Spirit. When did the Bible tell you to celebrate Christ's birth? 
Paul writes about the, the, the death, burial, resurrection, and the remember and then the memorial that Christ is coming. Number three. Oh, here we go. All I'm doing is putting Christ back into Christmas. The modern conservative cry to put Christ back into Christmas is absurd. The modern conservative. I said that. As detailed earlier in this report, get them all, read them all, listen to them all. You can get the read. You can get the, the, the printed form. Jesus Christ was never in Christmas. It is a lie to say he was. Did you get that clear? Let me do it clear for you. Jesus Christ was never in Christmas. It's a lie to say he was. Did you get that? He has no part in a lie. Satan has a lie. John 8, 44. When anyone takes the truth and mixes it with a lie, they no longer have the truth. Imagine, turn around, saying, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. And we wish you a Merry Christmas with the, with the shepherds and the wise men. As we fall down and worship that little idol with a 20-watt light bulb, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Messy, messy, messy. You still come out with a lie. One may say, well, I know it's not the truth, but I'll put Christ back in Christmas and glorify God in it then. No, you won't. Christ was never in Christmas. You cannot change a lie into the truth. It should be really be called Baal Mass, Nimrod Mass, Tammuz Mass, Mathurist Mass, Mary Mass. Christ mass is a lie. How about just call it a mess? Mess mass. You do know which church has a mass, don't you? You do know your Bible. You do check it twice and wonder what God is speaking to you. You do study your Bible, right? Pastor! Do you know church history? Do you know what the Bible says? You take part in this. There was more good words from Bill's ass than your mouth. You need to get down on your knees and repent. It's a lie. And you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ in tears. Liar, liar, your works will be on fire. And I know you don't like that. I am mad at any pastor who will bring this garbage into a church. You're sleeping with the enemy. That's adultery. Number four. I am using Christmas to witness for Christ, just like the, the Apostle Paul did. I've never heard that one, but he's got it here, so it must be something people have said. Some say that all they are doing is taking the truth from Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, and cultivating it as the Apostle Paul did in Acts 17 with Mars Hill. Wow, I've never heard that one. Taking the opportunity of the season to witness to the lost world. That sounds good, doesn't it? This would be fine if these Christians were actually doing it 
only as Paul did. Paul, in addressing the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill, proclaimed to them that they have, uh, excuse me, Paul proclaimed to them that their unknown God, to whom they had erected an altar, was none other than God who made the world and all the things therein. Paul was not intimidated by the pagan surroundings or symbols, nor did he <coughs> excuse me, berate the Greeks for their error, but merely show them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But do Christians really use the opportunity presented by the season? In the same way Paul used the opportunity of the pagan altar. Do Christians personally stand in front of their hometown public display, displays of Christmas, nativity scenes, and preach the gospel? When was the last time you saw at a nativity scene a bunch of Christians out there in the King James Bible saying, Repent! This is the one that came to die! He grew up! He died on the cross that you might have life! Have life more abundantly! I have not seen it once. I know churches that have live maternity, I mean maternity, whew, nativity scenes. With live animals and all the manure that, that follows their teaching. I'm not talking about the manure that comes from the animals. God gave the manure for the animals, but He didn't give them the manure to have a live nativity scene. Here we're live here in Bethlehem, Daytona Beach, Florida. To visit uh, a doll with a 10 foot light, light bulb in the middle of December. What? Garbage. It's nothing to do. Nothing like. Alright. To paraphrase Paul, do they say, men of Indianapolis, I see that in every way you are very religious. What you worship is something unknown. I am going to proclaim to you. Do they come out of the public schools where they have just attended the Christmas Xmas program and preach to the attendees about the true God? Who had been grossly misrepresented in the program they just had witnessed? Oh, well, you see, what we're going to do is we're going to get the little kitties up there. They're going to put their little program in, and the parents will come, and I'll give a 15 minute preaching. Wait a minute. You got 45 minutes of a lie, and you got 10 minutes of, of the truth you, you proclaim to say. But you really want those parents to come back next week, so you're not going to really say the truth because you'd be afraid they won't ever come back and take their children away. Even to the most, well, hardly, he says, hardly. Even to the most of those who understand the true origin of Xmas, I want to say Christmas. He says Xmas. I gotta get. The other day I was in church. Someone said Merry Christmas to me, and I, oh Lord, I repented. I said Merry Christmas back. It's been built in. This unique time of year means inviting unbelievers into their homes to gather around an Xmas tree to enjoy the beauty of wreaths. Absorb the heat of the Yule log, etc. Reason that they are only using the pagan form and pagan festival season as an opportunity to witness. So what you're going to do is you're going to tell them what's in your house is wrong. That you're going to tell them the right of what the wrong you're doing. Two wrongs don't make a right. If Paul meant this in Acts 17, he would have met the people in the Athenian, or Athenian temple or in his or their homes, got around their idols that they had Christianized, and was now going to use this as part of the worship. And Paul did not do that. Most of the people who decorate their homes and churches with Xmas trees, holy wreaths, nativity scenes, etc., are all supposed to us. Supposedly to be used as opportunities. VIA Xmas coffees 
neighborhood gift bag, gift exchange, Xmas concerts, etc. Are through to convince are thoroughly convinced that they're doing God's service. How can God use something that's unholy? What are you going to do if you got somebody saved? And the Lord works on their heart, and the Lord shows them Christmas is truly wrong. And they go back in there thinking, and say, hey, you know, that guy that witnessed to me and all that, and what kind of Christian was that guy? And since they are not involved in the in the crass, or I think it's supposed to be cross secular commercialization that the world reveals in, but have instead put Christ back in Xmas, so to speak, they reason that it's all biblical and pleasing to God. So, in other words, you just think God approves of what you're doing is wrong. I mean, I can have all the alcohol I want. I go into AA. I mean, I can have all the children I want. I keep on getting more and more uh, assistance from the government. Number five, it doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> Do I even got to explain this one? Many Christians who routinely make a habit of picking and choosing which Bible commands they will or will not obey. You know, they, they think that their Christianity is a is a flea market. I like this. I don't like this. I'll sell this. I'll keep this. Have likewise carried this practice over into justification of celebrating Christmas. Ooh. Why I can do it. They claim, but this is what they say, the Christmas tree, the mistletoe, the Santa Claus, etc. don't mean anything pagan to me. So I'll exercise my Christian liberty last night, and partake in it, all of it. And Paul says, yeah, though I got, though I'm saved and all that, I can continue the, the sin. And Paul says, no! God forbid! Obviously, if one were to take such a caliber approach to the physical world, I can drink rat poison because I choose not to regard its poison would likely lead to a quick physical death. Why then do Christians think they can avoid spiritual harm by ignoring God's spiritual warning? Having fun? The connection has been broken, number six. Number three. There are those who clearly recognize the pagan nature of the various Christmas worship forms and practices. But we're getting to people who know it's wrong. But they're making excuses to do what's wrong. They want the preacher, they want somebody to give them a permission slip from heaven that God said, go ahead and do. <coughs> Nevertheless, many of these Christians claim that because of the long passage of time from their pagan interception, to the present 6,000 years, the connection to paganism has been sufficiently diminished to allow the adoption of these forms and practices into our Christian worship and celebration. Time will heal all wounds. Not if you cut off your arm. It ain't going to grow back. While it may be true that most symbols have lost their original devilish meaning and significance in a modern society, it is strangely bizarre and ironic that Christian, I hate that word, seeks to commuter, com com commemorate, commemorate, excuse me, Christ's birth with the fade symbols of Satan. The still belongs to Satan. Whether he's got it locked up in the garage or not. 
And even though some God's people may be naive and ignorant about the source of these things, surely God is not. Can such things please him? And think about this. If it were possible to disconnect current practices from their pagan or occultic roots, why does scripture not provide us any guidelines as to how much time is it necessary for neutralization disassociation process to occur? Occur. Scripture doesn't say within time if, 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 if the occult and if the, the symbolism, if, if the witchcraft, if the forms, if the paganism dies out, you can bring it into the church. There's nothing. Which of the hundreds of ancient pagan rites would they be would then be acceptable for the adaptation into the Christian worship, since some of them are obviously more pagan and occultic than others? It's excuses. Well, there are hundreds of other items of daily life that have a pagan origin. Wow, we are just digging now into excuse bag. We've run out of things, so. It is said such things as the wedding ring, certain clothing customs, the modern division of time into hours and minutes, the names of the days of the week, etc., all have pagan connections in their origins. So, isn't it a contradiction on your part to say that their means have sufficiently changed while Christian means have not? But we are not saying that their meanings have changed. The question is one of using things of pagan origin in our worship of Christ. I don't use Monday or Thursday, Thor's Day. I don't use that in worshiping Christ. I don't use a wedding ring to, you know, Christ, come. No, I use a wedding ring to tell people, men and women, I'm married. There are some men out there take off the wedding ring to say, hey, I'm not married. I don't worship and adorn this. I don't say, hey, see my wedding ring? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. The question is one of using things of pagan origin in our worship of Christ. So we would ask the question back. Which of these pagan items do we focus on celebrate the birth of Christ? Or which of these Christians that Christianized which of these is Christianized and brought into our weekly worship or our daily devotion to Christ as you do with pagan forms of tradition of Exodus? You see, Christmas is worship. Days of the week, our hours are not worship. The origin of or the original or the origin of meanings of a custom, tradition, or form does not take on significance unless it is somehow specifically incorporated into or lined up with our worship. As we have already detailed in the section on Christian liberty, section 4, part B, these rings, clothing, customs, etc. would be merely the, the byproduct of paganism not paganism itself. And they have developed no religion, religious connotations or association of their own, as have the Christmas customs and traditions. Number eight. Baptism and circumcision have pagan origins and God still gave their use in scripture so what is wrong with the use of pagan forms of Christmas dig at the bottom of the barrel this time you know some ways circumcision can be a cleaner life 
a healthier life. But I'm not going to do it because, because the pagans did it. Doctors told me, I mean, outside a religious thing and stuff like that, you would be wise to circumcise a child, a son. This argument is frequently made by pastors who say that to be consistent. Pastors, those who would have us forbid the forms, symbols, and traditions of Christmas should also be, should also be calling for us to abandon believers' baptism. As pastors are using this excuse. Shouldn't the would-be banners of Christ be saying, since the ancient mysteries, religions practice forms of baptism, therefore baptism is a pagan custom and should be outlawed for the believer in Christ? But you can find baptism in the Bible. This is a strange arg argument for anyone to make, particularly a theologian. And in our opinion, in my opinion, I'll add to it, reveals a very low, or low view, I say very low view, of scriptural admonition. admonition. To say something like that, after what God has said, compared to what God has not said. Like a dog chasing his tail that's been hit by a tractor trailer. If baptism were absent from the Bible... As using pagan forms and traditions to celebrate or com com commemorate the birth of Christ are totally absent. There would be then no biblical justification for baptism. You ever think that maybe the pagans got it from God? But God has not commended us to celebrate or com commemorate Christ's birth in any way. But he has commanded us to baptize, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. You know, the first baptism is what God did to the earth. Genesis 1. Letter E. Abstain from all, oh, excuse me, abstain from all, I was going to say abstain from all parents of evil. That's the Bible verse. Abstain from the observance, abstain from the observance of Christmas. What then? Ought to be the Christian's response to this and other pagan and Roman invitations. Inventions. Invitations. Sure. You say, why invitations? Well, there was a time in church history when Constantine brought this all in so Christians wouldn't be killed. I'll bring this into you. And then, you know, we'll live happily ever after. So he said Roman inventions. I also say invitations. It cannot be denied that they are pagan, pure and simple. From the beginning to the end, God gives us specific instructions in his holy word. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the ways of the heathen. Jeremiah 10. Read that chapter. These words are, particularly, are perfectly clear. Now, conclusion. And there's a long conclusion. So I'm going to stop right there. We'll give you the conclusion, Lord willing, next time. I got off beat. I got angry. We got to realize this is a sin. I love the brethren. I love the lost. I want everyone to do to the honor of God, to the lost, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, to the saved, to, to learn the word, and to do that which is pleasing before God, to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I am angry with those that promote and encourage this kind of sin, where they don't condone it, they say, do it. And teach the Christian so. Well, my pastor doesn't say anything about it. Do you have a wreath? Do you have a tree? Do you have a Christmas celebration? Do you have a Christmas service? Do you have the candles? The candle night service? 
Do you sing some of the hymns, I mean, some of the carols that we sung or are worried about? If any part of this 21-page report has entered into your church, your church and your pastor supports Christmas. If he didn't, if the church didn't, you would not have all this stuff or any of this stuff. Let me find a verse here in James real quick. In James chapter 4, I believe it is. If not 4. Maybe it is 4. James. All right, this is not this is not the one I was looking for. This is this is another one I'm looking for. James four seventeen. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And there's another verse I'm, I was thinking of, and maybe it's not James. I thought it was James. Let me go a little earlier. But that's an important verse right there that we read. Oh, here we go. James 2.10. Well, I'm going to get rid of all that stuff, but I'm going to keep the tree. I'm going to keep all that stuff. Uh, we'll keep the presents. I'm going to do all that. I'm going to get rid of all that stuff, Brother Hater, but we're going to do the, the Christmas card next year. All right? Here we go. James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, one thing, one form of idolatry, one form of paganism, he is guilty of all. It's that plain and simple. I read you the scriptures. And I know, realize that it may take time to be weaned. You may not be able to get rid of this. If your heart is pure and you want to do right, and you say, well, listen, next Christmas, no tree, no lights. And, Lord, if you'll bless us with that and get, get rid of this stuff slowly by slowly, amen, glory to God. God knows your heart is right, and God knows you want to do. It's a big step. And it amazes me it's only one day a year and how much of a problem we have with it. One day, and I've got Christians mad at me for this. I have lost friends over Facebook because of this. It's a God. And we'll close for now, next week, Lord willing, or next time, the conclusion.